go. Happy Friday. Welcome, everyone. Got a little bit of snow today. What questions do you have about the lab, any of the Java stuff we've been uh, looking at, object-oriented programming, uh, to get us started? Chris. Um, I was still having trouble with um, the lab um, doing the point selection for different probabilities for an increasing number of points. Um, like, I know how you like hard to do that, but having it be more like mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is this thing in the lab where uh, you're tasked to choose how many coins are in the game, three coins 50% of the time, more than three 50% of the time. But then that second 50%, half of that time, there should be four, and the other half time, there should be more than four, uh, and so on. And <clears throat> one way to look at these probabilities that you're given is that Three should have happened one half of the time. Four should happen one half of the time that three doesn't happen, which is to say one half of the time times the half of the time that three doesn't happen. Five. Again, half of the time that four doesn't happen, you want five. And this is to highlight that these probabilities are coming from, uh, basically, if we flip a coin and it comes up tails, we'll do three. If it comes up heads, we'll do more than three. If we flip that coin comes up heads, and the second time it comes up tails, we'll do four. Comes up heads twice, we'll do at least five, maybe more than five. If we want to put this into code, there are a number of different ways to basically flip a coin in Java, get something with 50% uh, uh, of the time, a nice way is this Bernoulli function, a uh, uh, static method of the standard random class. It's going to give us true 50% of the time, false the rest of the time. And so the nice algorithm this gives us is that we just want to keep flipping this coin. And as long as it's coming up heads, as long as it's true, keep increasing the number of coins we'll have in our game. And as soon as it comes up false, that's how many coins we should have. So if we say the number of coins is going to start out at 3, and then we want to have some element of Java that says as long as this as long as that returns true we want to increase the number of coins and this will have the effect of giving us this probability because each Time we ask, is this going to come up true? That's a 50% chance. And so we get this progression where each further increase in the number of coins has another sort of 50 50 shot, and it builds up to three. Since we're starting at three, if the first time we do this comes up false, which it does half the time, then we'll just stick with three. The first time it comes up true, we increase the number of coins to four, and we go again. Does this make sense? Questions on this?
So I'm kind of deliberately leaving this in pseudocode so that you can practice turning this idea into Java. But each of these will basically ma match a single line of Java. Single line of Java to increase this variable up by one. And a single line of Java that is going to loop, that is going to repeat when something is true. Other questions about the, the lamp? Let's hear. Um, so when I was trying to pronounce the array, it was giving me like random symbols and that was like saying, it was like a memory address, I'm not really sure. So like is the true two string method supposed to reconvert that? And if so, how do I convert like int in an array? Yes, so this is a, a, a good uh, question. So just do a little demo code here where if we have an int array and I'll make it the array 3762 just for, for demonstration purposes and I want to print and I try and print out the array, run this program. We see exactly what Leslie is describing. We're getting this complete inscrutable nonsense that is printing out. And this happens when we go to print out an object that doesn't have a nice two string method. Because whenever we print out an object, Java automatically calls its two-string method to get what the string that should print out should be. And we can see that an int array really does not have a helpful two-string method. It has the default one all objects have, which print out something to do with where in memory, where in the computer's memory this object is, not helpful to us in this case. So, does so anyone have a suggestion for how we could get Java to show us what the actual integers in this array is? Oh, yeah. So it turns out there's a static method, uh, arrays to string, that can take in an array and give us back a nice string version of it. So if I run this, prints out a nice string version of the array. And I did have to import this arrays thing up at the top. VS Code filled this in automatically for me. So if we can import that, then what is the two-string method like asking us to do? So the two-string method of the coin strip class is the purpose of it is to show the player what the current board of the game looks like. So it's to show, uh, so if our coins array that's keeping track of the positions of our coins uh, was uh, zero, two, three. We'd want to print out something like, okay, there's coin zero, and then two, uh, and then position one is empty, and then position two has coin one in it, and position three has coin two in it. We want to print out a two string should return this a string something like this. Could be as simple as this, could be fancier, that's up to you. But it needs to return some string that sort of displays what the board of the game currently looks like. And so just printing out 0, 2, 3 would not be displaying the board. That, that's just how we're internally keeping track of the game. 
Yeah, thanks. When you print it out in the string, do you all do you want the whole thing just on one line? Do you want in the two string? So as I've written here, you would um, return a single string that was this whole thing. Um, and there's ways you could kind of make the string a lot fancier where it would take multiple lines, but that is not expected. It can be all on the same line. And we're going to do a bit of practice in a minute that I think will help uh, uh, you see how we might write a method that sort of builds up this sort of string. Other questions? All right. Let us practice. So first, let's uh, practice uh, writing a method that returns a Boolean. Uh, your is valid move method uh, in the coin strip class needs to do something like this, not exactly course, but here we have a method that takes in three integers and needs to return true when the second integer, b, is between a and c, and when all three integers are positive. I have four possible expressions that would go where the comment says fill in after a turn. So take a moment and think about which of these four would accomplish uh, what the comments say this method needs to do. And a reminder that these double ampersands are how we write Boolean and. In Python, it's actually the word and. In Java, it's not as nice. It's two ampersands. All right, we're mostly thinking it's B. Please have a quick conversation with your neighbor for why the answer you chose matches uh, what's described in the comments. Had some movement toward B. That's great. This is how we write in Java a Boolean expression to check kind of multiple things. A is greater than zero, and A is less than B, and B is less than C. Does so this make sense? What are your questions on this? All right, let's look at a two-string method. Make the code bigger. So this is a some game that's a little bit different than our coin strip but has some similarities uh, we have a field that's an int array called pieces and that int array has just two we we know it has just two entries and so we know that this array has two entries the first one is the position of the x piece, and the second one is the position of the o piece. And it's just on a line like in our coin strip. And what this two string is doing is declares an empty string, board, and then is adding other strings onto this string, sort of building it up piece by piece so that when we get all the way down to here, it will have, for example, if x was at position 2 and o was at position 5, the string we would want to return would be blank, blank, x, blank, blank, Oh. So there are a couple holes in the code for these for loops. Uh, first is where this first loop should stop putting in blanks, where we then put in an x. 
And then for the second loop, where we would start this variable i as it goes up to the position of O. So I have four possibilities here. Uh, separated by a comma is what would fill in that first blank. What would go here? Second is what would go in here. All right, we're evenly divided among A, B, and D. We've ruled out answer B. So uh, it might be helpful to, with your neighbors, talk through this particular example. For this particular example, we want to produce this string. And so to try and work out uh, how these possible answers relate to this specific example with your neighbors. Big movement toward A, that is excellent. That is what we will, we will need to do here. Uh, someone uh, share with us if you changed your answer or, or something that helps you understand how this was working as you discussed with your neighbors? Um, I think the, uh, the period sign sort of threw me off. If it was like less than or equal, maybe I would have chosen C. But uh, sort of knowing that because it is inferior, the loop stops right there, um, showed me that I needed to add one to the second, uh, to, yeah, the C one. <coughs> Yeah, and this one way to think about this is that this first number, if we fill in pieces zero, that tells us how many blanks we're going to add on to our string, how many of these, how many times we're get, going to add this underscore before we add x. So if this is two, that means we're going to add two underscores before we get to x. And then this second is really, okay, which position do we sort of resume putting in blanks after we put in x? If it was pieces zero, that is the position that x is at, whereas pieces zero plus one is the position one past where x is, which is where we want to start putting in blanks. Uh, and... We can go kind of up to, but stop before we get to the position of O. So we kind of go up to right before we should actually add on O. What are your questions about this? this uh, is this making sense? So in terms of thinking about how to sort of adapt this, approach to coin strip what's the big difference when we're thinking about the coin strip game versus this scenario Peter. you don't know how many pieces you will have exactly the number of pieces isn't fixed this scenario said there's always two but in the coin strip we have multiple numbers of coins and so I think that you'll want to approach this using uh, nested loops. Because for each coin, however many there are, you'll want to put into the string some amount of blanks plus something marking that there's a coin there. And I've, uh, at the algorithm level, you might think of uh, having a variable, uh, maybe coin index, it's going to kind of keep track of which coin you're on in terms of which coin you're putting in blanks and then something for the coin for. And then you might have an inner for loop, something like the second one here, where you're always looping from the position of the previous coin, plus one, up to right before the position of the coin, 
that you're currently putting in uh, the part of the board for. And the previous position, you might start out as, as uh, zero, so that for the first coin, you start putting in stuff at zero, go up to the position of the first coin, add on something to the string for the first coin, uh, and then you'd, outside of the inner loop, increase the coin index to kind of move to the next coin in terms of what you'll be adding on to the string, what you'll be what part of the board you'll be assembling. Any questions on this before, before we move on? All right, I hope that was helpful uh, for some of the, the tough parts of, um, of the lab. Uh, uh, good, uh, good questions and discussion on the Lab 1 check-in form. Uh, you're not limited to just posting there once. Uh, you can post uh, questions there as you keep working. Uh, also, uh, if you prefer uh, to stay in touch over Slack, I have made a uh, Slack for uh, our class, and there's a link to join the Slack on the Moodle. All right. So, last time, we left off talking about how we would implement an extensible array how we would make an array that could get bigger as we needed it to. And we said that our class array int list was going to have an internal, a private field, private instance variable data that's an array of integers that we're actually using to store our data, and an int count that keeps track of how many integers are, we're actually storing at the moment, had a constructor that initialized our count to zero uh, and created our array of data, and then said we're going to have an add method that lets us add a new integer on to the end of our list. And we said we're going to have this some method called ensure capacity that's going to make sure we have enough space. We're just going to trust that that's going to ensure that we have at least one more spot than the current number of things in our array list to make sure that then we can put in to our internal array this at the end of it uh, our uh, the, the element that we're adding and then increase the count. With me so far? Questions on this setup? Okay. Why are we putting count inside data? Uh, so count here is acting as an index uh, into our array data. Uh, and the intuition for this is that, let's say data uh, we started out with five spots. Uh, when we first create our array list, how many thing, how many integers are we currently storing in it? Zero. Right? We just created this new array list. There's not any integers in it, so our count should 
should be zero because it's supposed to be the number of things that are currently in here. Now there's this convenient thing where whatever our count is, in this case zero, if we use it as an index, that's the basically the first open spot in our array data. So if our count is zero, the spot we should put the next integer is at index zero. At which point we put three in here, we change count to one. Now if we use count as an index, it's again the kind of the next spot in our internal array. And so we're just taking advantage that we don't need to separately keep track of the count and also the next index that we should use because it turns out those are the same thing. Does that make sense? Other questions? All right, so before we get to this mysterious ensure capacity, uh, I just want to uh, highlight a couple other um, couple other operations that we might want our array list to support. And by operations, I mean public methods. Methods that someone that creates an object of this class could use. One of those might be a git method that takes an index and returns the integer that's at that index in our array list. So it'd be a convenient thing to have because this is something we can do with arrays. We can index, we can get the element at a specific index in an array, and so our array list should have that same capability. And so this will be a very simple one-line method. Any suggestions for what we would return for the element at a particular index in our array list. And we do? On that index. Yeah, we have our internal array data. And we can just return what we've stored at that index. We could have. A another public method uh, that doesn't return anything. Where someone can say, okay, set the element at this specific index to be this value. Again, we just take this sort of idea and apply it to our internal array. And I picked these two, get and set specifically, uh, to demonstrate this object-oriented programming idea, if we have our private data, in this case we've also named that variable data, and as an integer array, if we made this public, then someone could just directly go in and change the values in it. But instead, the sort of object-oriented way is that the data, the var these variables are private, and we create these public methods that sort of provide an, an interface, provide kind of a particular name for how to do these, get something out of the array, set a particular element to the array. Questions on this? All right, so now comes the method that makes this 
array array list actually extensible that does our sort of grow as needed magic. I might make this method private so that uh, it can only be used internally, that it's not something that someone who creates this, uh, an instance of this array list should know about or should use. So private void ensure capacity and it takes in a number which is this is how much space we're supposed to make sure uh, is in our internal uh, internal array so there are a few different cases that we have to think about in terms of ensure capacity um, I'd like you to uh, take a couple minutes and brainstorm with your neighbors kind of what the different cases we might have to handle or think about would be in terms of we want to ensure our, our array, our array data has this much capacity, and when this is called, what different situations might we be in. So take a couple minutes and, and brainstorm that with your neighbors. There is enough room in the um, array. Exactly. If we already have at least this much, at least as many spots in our array, we don't have to do anything. With that, that capacity already exists. So, uh, you might say that if. data.length is greater or equal to our desired capacity, well, we don't have anything we need to do. And we can just return. So it's only if the number of spots that we need in our array is bigger than how many are currently there, that's when we actually have to do something. And so there are kind of a few steps here, which is we need to we need to determine how big we're going to make our array if we need to make it bigger. Uh, we need to Create a new array of that size. And then we need to copy over to our new array what was in the old array that we're about to get rid of. So to go through these uh, one at a time, uh, In terms of determining the capacity, one approach would be, let's make our new array exactly as big as we're being asked to. Does anyone see a potential downside to that approach? Yeah. What does allow you to add, like any more? Exactly, that if we make it exactly this big, then we can add one more thing. But then if we need to add one more than that, we again have to go through this whole process. So if we increase the, the size of our internal array just one at a time, we're just going to have to be constantly doing that every time we add something. So I'd really like to do... Uh, increase it by more than that so that we can add more things to our array for a while before we need to, again, make it bigger. And so a common way to do this is to 
say I'm going to guess that uh, uh, the new length is the length of the current array, which I know is not uh, so. Rather, I'm going to guess that how big I should make the new one is twice the current array. And do we know that that's going to be big enough? Why would we do that if um, you mentioned that we want to save as much memory as possible? So uh, that's a fair point. Uh, there is a trade-off here. There's a balance where, uh, as I was just saying, we could increase the size by the minimum necessary amount to exactly capacity, but then we might have to spend a lot of work constantly increasing the size. Whereas maybe if we double it, we might waste some space, but it will be at most half of the space that we need. If we were to in increase it just immediately to 100 million, then we might be wasting like uh, 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 99 million, 900, 99,000, and, and so. So doubling it turns out to be sort of a nice balance between we don't waste too much memory potentially, but also we don't have to increase the capacity all the time. Well, what if we're at 500,000? Well, let's say we're at 500 million, and I want to add one element to it, and you gave me an array of a billion. How does that trade into my, you know, benefit? Yes, yeah, so that's an important sort of, uh, that, that's a good scenario to consider. Um, and that might argue for maybe this ensure capacity method should be public and not private. So in that situation, whoever is using the array can actually make it 500 million and one instead of we're just deciding for them that it's going to be a billion. Um, but to continue with our uh, uh, implementation here, do we know whether twice our current size uh, will meet our desired capacity. Yeah. No. No, we, we cannot assume that. So we'll say, all right, we'll guess that this is enough, but then we'll say while it's less than the amount that we should have, we're just going to Continue doubling it until it gets big enough. So that's our determining how much space we actually want. Creating the array. Is then straightforward. We say we have an int array, new data equals an int array that's new length integers long. And finally, to copy over the old data, anyone have a suggestion for a sort of uh, a high level idea of what we would do to copy? the contents of one array to another. Surfing? Can you do like a nested loop? What's like the first loop goes through the original array, takes that, that data, and then the second part of the loop just loops through the uh, new data array and just like paste it in there? Yeah, it, it will, we'll want to use a, a, a loop, and we can actually do this with just one loop because the indexes of our arrays actually are, they match up, so we can just Kind of go through each index and copy from the old to the new, specifically for index zero. 
up to our old array. We will say our new data at that index is the old number in our uh, in the the same integer is in our old old array. Does this make sense? Questions on this? Oh, yeah. Well, it's not really a jump. Does Python do the same thing as um, in terms of doubling it or the arrays? Uh, I don't know for sure whether the Python list does this, uh, but this is a kind of the most common technique for having this sort of extensible array. Uh, so whether it's exactly a factor of two, like you might choose different factors, um, that just is the trade-off in terms of how much copying you have to do versus how much memory you use. Um, but my guess would be that yes, Python in its internal implementation of the list does something like this. Uh, because underneath it is dealing with arrays of, of a fixed size. Um, because Python is implemented in either Java or C, which have exactly this sort of behavior. Jeffrey? Is there like um, any more efficient way to copy like an old array into a new array without traversing the entire range of four loops? Um, so uh, there may, again, I. Uh, uh, I would have to, to look it up. There may be a sort of, like we saw that arrays to string, there may be a sort of function that can do this without us having to write a for loop, but underneath it's still doing this for loop. Um, there's, uh, except in special cases, there's not a way to do this sort of copying without just going through each thing you want to copy and, and doing that. Yeah, sorry. How do you measure the trade-off between uh, memory and repeating code. Uh, how do we how we navigate trade-offs in general? It comes down to what the actual application uh, that uh, is, meaning that uh, whether the trade-off is worth it depends on exactly what we are doing. So for example, if I am writing software for, say, a drone that has a very small amount of memory, then maybe any trade-off that uses a bunch more memory is really unappealing because memory is very scarce. Alternatively, uh, this MacBook has quite a lot of memory, all things considered. And so using a bit more memory to save uh, some work totally worth it. And so whether the trade-off is worth it just really depends on what the situation is. Sure. I'm not sure if I'm the one that's like trying to understand this, but shouldn't it be like i less than equal to? Or is it just like less than? So if we have an array with three things in it, oh. our indexes are 0, 1, and 2. So we don't ever want to go up to do index 3. That would be past the end. Last step here, we actually need to change over from data being our official sort of private field. We need to have it refer to this new data instead. And so we would need to do data equals new data. After we've copied over the old data, we don't need to keep that around anymore. So we can just switch it over to the new data. All right, we're, we don't have a lot of time. So it's important that I tell you about President Zachary Taylor. Uh, this, uh, uh, don't have a whole lot to say about Zachary Taylor. I've seen him referred to as a forgettable 
president. Uh, he was um, something that political parties did during this period was say, you know, this guy, he's well known, sort of famous. We don't really know what his politics are, but he could probably win an election. So let's let's nominate him and lead our party to victory. This is what happened with Zachary Taylor. Uh, the Whig Party was like, hey, you're, you're a war hero. People like you. You won some battles in the Mexican-American War. Uh, you're super vague on what your political views are. You've never been interested in politics, but you could probably win the election. So we'll nominate you. Uh, that was a good bet. He did win. He uh, defeated poor Henry Clay for the nomination. And uh, Zachary Taylor... Uh, oh, also in this same election, saw the first, uh, our, our old friend Martin Van Buren ran as the Free Soil uh, Party candidate. Uh, this is sort of a, a precursor to uh, the Republican Party. It's a party entirely dedicated to the issue of new U.S. territory should not allow slavery. And this question of, of where should slavery be allowed was the uh, if political issue of the day. Zachary Taylor tried to kind of, uh, he was a, a southerner and a, and a slave owner, he, but he, he, he tried to sort of work out compromise and, and calm tensions, not at all successful. Uh, for context, here's a map of uh, what the extent of uh, the United States was at the time. This is the time in which Minnesota territory uh, shows up. And uh, Zachary Taylor, second president to die in office, uh, not after one month, like poor William Henry Harrison, but after 16 months. So next time we will hear about his vice president, Millard Fillmore, who uh, stepped in uh, upon his death. All right. Last few minutes of, of data structures. Um, so it's worth asking kind of what the efficiency of this ensure capacity method is. And in particular, what its efficiency is in the context of repeatedly adding new things to our array list. And Something we can do to think about its efficiency is kind of count up how much work it's going to have to do. So in the case where we add a new element and we already have space for it, we have to do kind of we have to check that we have enough space. It's kind of one step. We have to update the element in the array, second step, and then update count, three steps. And so no matter whether it's the fifth element or the 5,000th element, if we have space for it, we kind of do just a few steps, no matter how big our, our list is. So uh, And you might say that that is a constant amount of work. It's sort of a, a fixed amount. It doesn't depend on the, the size of the number we're adding or the size of our, our array. If we don't have enough space, that's when we have to double the size of our array and copy everything over. And that's an amount of work uh, proportional to however big our array list currently is, however many numbers are currently in there, we have to loop through all of them and copy them over. And so we would say that is a linear amount of work. We have kind of for each thing, for each element in our array, we do kind of that much work. So the question is, if we If we add n ints, how much total work 
do we have to do? Because sometimes it's constant, sometimes it's linear. And uh, the exact kind of uh, way to arrive at this answer is in, is in the text notes. Uh, but the quick version is this combination of constant and linear it averages out to linear, meaning that on average, we do a constant amount of work. Sometimes we have to do linear, the rest of the time we do constant, and this averages out to a linear amount of work to add and integers. Uh, this is good news, because it means that to create an array of uh, a fixed size array of size n, that takes linear work. And to make this fancy flexible array, it works out to, on average, still a linear amount of work. Uh, and it comes down to this, this strategy of doubling each time we need to make it bigger is what kind of lets us average out to uh, not, doing, not doing any extra work to have this flexible array. All right. That, I'm afraid, is all the time that we have today. So uh, next time, uh, we're a bit behind, but we'll uh, get back on the train to talk about linked lists. Uh, good luck working on uh, finishing up the lab uh, this weekend and Monday. I have office hours Monday afternoon after class. Uh, stay in touch via Slack and the forum, and have a good weekend.